Redeemer family, good morning. It is good to be with you on this Lord's Day. Uh, I'd encourage you at this time, as Jimmy, or I guess it's Andre, uh, puts up the QR code up there uh, that you register for worship. You can take out your smartphone and uh, aim your camera there and register uh, for worship. That helps us in our process of shepherding uh, our people. Uh, it also has access to links to our various announcements. <laughs> This morning, and I want to call your attention to several of those announcements on the last two pages here. And by the way, you also have the QR code to register here. Um, I want to call your attention to a couple of the announcements. First of all, uh, this Sunday is the last Sunday that we have for Sunday school in the spring. For the next three weeks, so we will have Sunday school this Sunday, but for the next three weeks, we won't have Sunday school. And uh, then we'll resume with summer Sunday school on June 5th. The marriage seminar is coming up this Friday and Saturday, May 13th and 14th. There's child care provided. There's food. There are still slots available for you to sign up. And so we'd encourage you to take advantage of that with Ed and Emily Hartman as they'll be giving us skills and strategies for connecting in marriage. Next Saturday morning, um, and in the afternoon, Levi Gill will be leading a team for our second Saturday serve. And we're going to have actually three different teams. One of those teams is going to go do a construction project where they're widening a door. The other two teams are going to go and connect with families with disabilities. They're partnering with RED, Redeemer Engaging Disabilities. And so if you're looking for a way to serve, we want to develop and cultivate those habits of regularly serving others in our parish and in our congregation and in our city. So that's next Saturday. The following Tuesday, if you want to get your hands dirty on May 17th, uh, our CA is going to be having the garden work day. And they're going to be cultivating uh, the garden over here, and you can come join them. That's Tuesday, May 17th. Then on May 20th, Redeemer Young Adults is going to be gathering at the reservoir for outdoor games and a cookout. Uh, we want to invite all of our young adults to come participate there, and you can contact, you can text uh, Wilson Jameson for more information. Summer is slowly sneaking up on us here, and June 13th through the 16th, we're going to have Vacation Bible School, and Juwan is looking for your help. Um, right now, he's looking for boxes, cardboard boxes, lots of boxes. I imagine if you're like our family, we get a fair number of boxes that come to our home to drop things off, save them, drop them off at the church. We need boxes. We also need volunteers. There will be more information coming about those volunteers in the upcoming weeks with a place to register for that. But we need volunteers and we need boxes for VBS. And then I want you to notice here, too, on the end of the announcements, you've got the Redeemer's School logo with their QR code. And if you click on that QR code, it will take you to their blog where you can see all of the different updates about what's happening at the Redeemer School. And uh, this most recent update is about their new mascot, uh, the lion, which is pretty, a pretty exciting uh, development. It looks really cool uh, out there. So that's the Redeemer School Corner there at the bottom of your, your page of announcements. And then this is May 8th. So to all you mothers out there, Happy Mother's Day. Uh, thank you for the way that you have loved us, loved your children. Uh, thank you for the way that we see in your love and in your care a reflection of God to us and his tenderness and his love for us. Kids, 
Hug your mom. T- tell, her, tell her how awesome she is uh, today. But we also know that this isn't an easy day for everyone. Some of you may have lost your mom in the last year. Some of you long to be moms and aren't yet. Some of you have lost children that you didn't get to see grow up. Some of you have lost unborn babies that you never got to meet. And our prayer for you is that Jesus would be a comfort to you today. I want to welcome you this morning to Redeemer with this. To all who are weary and need rest, to all who mourn and long for comfort, to all who feel worthless and wonder if God cares, to all who fail and desire strength, to all who sin and need a Savior, this church opens wide her doors with a welcome from Jesus Christ, the ally of his enemies, the defender of the guilty, the justifier of the inexcusable, and the friend of sinners. Welcome. Now Steve Lanier is going to come and call us to worship. Steve? All righty. Uh, please stand as God calls us into his worship this morning, Revelation 21, verses 3 through 5. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be, with his, they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Amen? Amen. Amen. Oh, please be seated, and we're going to uh, go before our wonderful Father and Savior this morning in prayer. Join me in prayer. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and we thank you that we can do that. Uh, thank you for Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Thank you for calling us to yourself through him, by your spirit. Thank you this morning that we are before your throne by faith in Christ and him alone, but we come with confidence in his good work, in your will, and in your love for us. Thank you for adopting us as your sons and daughters. You're an amazing parent, a loving father. Sir, we thank you for giving us a mediator between the two of us, us and you with Jesus. So we thank you for that. Sir, we ask this morning that you would come and and be with us in our worship. Literally, we're asking you to come and help us in our worship. Inhabit the praises of your people, that you might be blessed by our worship and we be blessed with your presence. And we thank you that we can invite you and that you will come. Thank you for your Holy Spirit this morning, guiding and directing the worship. Sir, we thank you that you have forgiven our sins. We confess before you this morning that we have sinned against you in our thought, words, and deeds. The intentions of our heart are evil all the time continuously is what you say. We agree with you in that. And you said that if we confess our sin, agree with you about our sin, that you're faithful and just to forgive our sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So we want to thank you for hearing our confession. We thank you for your forgiving grace and mercy. Thank you for clearing the slate. Thank you for removing any obstacle between you and us. Thank you for hearing this prayer this morning. Thank you for your presence. And now, Father, enjoy the worship in Jesus' name. Amen. So now let's all stand and join our voices together and sing songs of praise.
So this morning we're going to be reading uh, together. We're actually going to be reciting together a portion of our uh, confessions. And th those are our, uh, it's our beliefs. This is what we believe. And it's a, a way of encouraging ourselves and one another, teaching our children the truths of Scripture. They've just been brought down to a, a little concise spot. So we're going to be reading together from the Westminster Confession of Faith. And then... Uh, I'm going to ask some questions from the Westminster Shorter Catechism. And our catechism, again, is a, is a teaching tool. It's an oral tradition where the teacher would ask the student, uh, a father or a mother asking their son or daughter a question, and that the child would respond uh, to that question. So we're going to read together from the Westminster Confession, and then I'm going to ask uh, some questions from the catechism, and you respond. That sound all right to you? Let us recite together then from Westminster Confession of Faith 8.2. The Son of God, the second person in the Trinity, being very and eternal God, one of substance and equal with the Father, did, when the fullness of time was come, take upon man... With the Son... Man, you got to hear that from up here. I got lost and I got in it. Man, thank you so much for reciting that truth. That was beautiful up here. All right, let me ask this question from Westminster, uh, Shorter Catechism 21. Who is the Redeemer of God's elect? Shorter Catechism 29. How are we made partakers of the redemption purchased by Christ? Westminster Shorter Catechism 30. How doth the Spirit apply to us the redemption purchased by Christ? Then, from the Shorter Catechism 33, what is justification? May I get an amen? Amen. amen. Thank you.
That is a good word. Redeemer, let's pray together. Our great God and Father, we praise you and thank you for your presence here as you have promised in Scripture. You're the only worthy object of praise and thanksgiving. Jesus, today we ask that you make our worship worthy of the creator of the universe. This universe, which is unknowable in its vastness and its detail. We confess our motivation for worship is almost never pure. We come here looking for things, for immortality or to satisfy a comforting tradition, something like that. Many of us come here to learn or know truth, but then we suppress the terrifying reality of a truth-giving God who demands everything from us. We're like the rest of the world in this way. Our culture searches for you in science, in government, in charity, relationships, entertainment, activism. They do those things in order to know truth. But they and we never serve in any way in order to be known by the truth. To be known by you, Lord, that's a horror we avoid at all costs until we can't. We've learned so much about you. We know that your ways are much higher than our ways. You've given, given us good laws, a beautiful and robust world and cosmos to live in. We know what moral behavior is. We know we owe our existence to you. And yet, to really know you, we've got to let our guard down. We must lay ourselves open to the realization that we are the problem. There's war on the other side of the world and murder in our Jackson City streets. And once we go, get over the cynicism, we're the problem. There's no injustice that we can name, not racism or political corruption, or disease, adultery. No injustice that our sin has not helped give a foothold in this world. Lord, it doesn't seem fair, but neither was the cross. And that's the glorious reason that allows us to come to you now. And any time, as adopted sons and daughters, praises to your name. Lord, thank you for Jackson, our beautiful and broken city, this gigantic contradiction. It used to be known as the buckle of the Bible belt. So why is our city not transformed? Why is there a church on so many corners? And there's so much crime, and the water issues, and litter, trouble schools, shootings, potholes, corruption, all manner of civil decay. Lord Jackson needs you. It needs professing Christians of every stripe, starting with us in this sanctuary, to realize first that we are just as broken as our city, and to begin redemptive work in the low-hanging ministries and the needs that are right in front of us every day, if we will dare to see it. Change us, Lord. We need it. Every day, make us more like Christ, no matter how uncomfortable it is. We can start with these service opportunities in our bulletin next Saturday, assisting and encouraging families families with disabilities, 
or working on the, in the garden or preparing to help with vacation Bible school. We can pray for our church leadership or the awesome work of the Redeemer School. But we focus on our needs, which is really all we can bring to you. And we have so many. We just heard that little Jubilee Stone, two weeks old, was taken to the pediatric ICU last night. We pray for healing there and wisdom for doctors. Bless Lydia Abraham and her pain and weakness. We're asking for healing and that you'll draw her and her family close to you. And Lord, there are plenty of unspoken prayers among us today. Thank you that you meet us where we are, whether we're in a low valley or at the mountaintop. We're praying for our families and that marriages would thrive. Children like Little Jubilee and Liam Newell would see parents seeking your will in their lives. Specifically today, I lift up our moms, who are the best picture of your unconditional love for us. Thank you for the sacrifices that they gladly make for their children, and we honor them today. Prepare us, as in a few moments, Pastor Brian leads us through the unvarnished gospel in John 14. We're praying in the name of the object of that gospel, Christ Jesus, our big brother in the faith. Amen.
I can't stop praising his name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Redeemer Choir. Well, good morning. My name is Brian, and this morning we're going to continue our series on Jesus' seven I am statements as they're found in the Gospel of John. And in these seven statements, Jesus is revealing his character. He's sharing with you his identity. He's telling you about himself. These are core and foundational truths about the person and work of Jesus. And we've already seen in John chapter 6, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And in John chapter 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And in John 11, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. And last week, we looked at John 8, where Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And this morning, we're going to be looking at John 14 and verse 6, where Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, scholars say that that is the premier statement of the gospel in the gospel of John. So, if you want to share the gospel with others, this is it. If you want to preach the gospel to yourself, here it is. And I'd encourage you to memorize this verse. And if you track with me through the rest of this morning, you will probably have it memorized at the end of our time together. It was mentioned to me last week that I didn't mention any movies, so I want to begin this morning with four. What do The Wizard of Oz, uh, Castaway, The Martian, and Unbroken have in common? What do The Wizard of Oz, Castaway, The Martian, and Unbroken have in common? They're all movies about getting home. You see, we want to see if Dorothy is going to make it from Oz back to Kansas, and we want to see if Tom Hanks is going to make it from his deserted island back to Memphis, and we want to see if Matt Damon is going to make it from Mars back to Earth, and we want to see if Louis Zamperini will make it from the middle of the Pacific Ocean to a prisoner of war camp in Japan back to California. Will they get home? And in all four of these movies, in all four of these stories, the hero, the protagonist, experiences harsh surroundings, and they overcome insurmountable odds. They escape certain death, and they uncover a surprising way home. And we're captivated. We can't get enough. And quite honestly, I'm not sure that we should be, right? Like, Tom Hanks in Castaway, this is a movie about a man on a deserted island for four years, right? There are no other characters, there's no gripping dialogue, there's no real action, and yet we're captivated. Why? Because we want to see if Tom Hanks is going to make it home. Ron Howard, when he was casting for Apollo 13, asked this question. He said, who is America going to cheer for the most to make it home? And the answer was Tom Hanks. And so he cast Tom Hanks in the leading role of Apollo 13. Will Tom Hanks make it home? Now, this isn't a new phenomenon. Pilgrim's Progress has sold more copies in the English language than any other book other than the Bible. It sold 250 million copies. It was written in 1678 by John Bunyan, and it's the story of Christian. And Christian is an everyman character. And it's the story of Christian's journey from the city of destruction where he lives, this world, to the celestial city, the world that is to come, which is on top of Mount Zion. And Christian, along the way, encounters all all sorts of colorful characters, like the evangelist and Mr. Worldly Wise Man and faithful and atheist. And the good news is you don't really have to guess who the characters are, right? Their name gives you everything you need to know. 
And there are colorful places that he encounters, like the Slough of Despond and the King's Highway and the Valley of the Shadow of Death. And the question is, will Christian make it home? Will Christian make it to the celestial city? And that's what our passage is about this morning. You see, the reason that we can't get enough of stories about getting home is because it's one of the deepest desires of the human heart, and it echoes the truest story ever told. You see, deep down, every human being has the innate sense that they're separated from God, and they're looking for a way home. We're going to look at the passage this morning under three headings. First of all, we're going to consider in verses 1 through 3 the place, and then in verses 4 through 6 the way, and then in verse 6 the truth and the life. So, the place, the way, and the truth and the life. And here's what I'm going to tell you this morning. Jesus is the only way home, and to be on the way is to know truth and to have life. Jesus is the only way home, and to be on the way is to know truth and have life. So let's focus our attention this morning at John chapter 14, starting at verse 1. This is the word of the Lord. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, all of our lives we've been looking for a way home. And Father, I pray this morning as we consider Jesus' statement where he says, I am the way, I pray that you would convince us of our sin and misery, that you would enlighten our minds in the knowledge of Christ, and that you would renew our wills by the power of your gospel through the work of your Holy Spirit and the mediation of your Son. I ask that you would forgive the one who teaches his sins, for they are many. May we see Jesus and him only. Amen. So first of all this morning, let's consider together then the place, the place, verses 1 through 3. So verse 1, Jesus begins and says, let not your hearts be troubled. Well, why would their hearts be troubled? Well, you need to understand the context here. The book of John is divided into two books. Chapters 1 through 12 is the book of signs, and chapters 13 to 21 is the book of glory. And the book of glory revolves around the crucifixion, which begins with the betrayal in chapter 18 and goes through the end of the book. But ahead of the crucifixion in John 13 to 17 is the upper room discourse. And this is Jesus with his disciples on the night of his betrayal in the upper room. And he begins, John sets the scene here in John 13, 1. You can scroll up. He sets the scene for Jesus washing the disciples' feet with this. Now, before the feast of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So Jesus is departing out of this world and going to the Father. And then in John 13, 33, Jesus says, where I am going, you cannot come. 
Verse 36, Simon Peter says to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answers, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will afterwards. And then you can hear the angst in Peter's words. Peter says to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus answers, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow. Morning will not come till you have denied me three times. And then Jesus says, and I wonder here if he's looking at Peter, let not your hearts be troubled. You see, there's separation anxiety. Jesus is leaving, and they can't follow, and there's grief. Their hearts are troubled. And where is Jesus going? Look at verse 2. In my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? Jesus is going to prepare a place. And this place, oh, brothers and sisters, this place is the new heavens and the new earth. And I'd encourage you this afternoon to meditate on Revelation 21 through Revelation 22, verse 5, because it's a picture of the new heavens and the new earth. And in Revelation 21, John is grasping for metaphors to describe the overwhelming beauty of his vision of the new Jerusalem. And he sees the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. And it's this cubical garden city that simultaneously has easy access with 12 gates and substantial safety with high walls. And it has indescribable beauty. There are 12 kinds of jewels that are all over the city. And there are streets of gold. And the river of life is coming from the throne and the tree of life, the promise of life itself is there. And Jesus says, in this place, in my Father's house, there are many rooms. There are many rooms. Now that word for rooms as a noun only appears two times in all of Scripture. It could also be translated as dwelling or abode. But the verb the verb is used all the time in Scripture. Well, not all the time, right? But it's used 170 times in Scripture and 40 times in the book of John. 40 times in the book of John. And the verb can be translated remain or live or dwell. Or most frequently, it's translated abide. It's translated abide. And next to believe in the Gospel of John, abide, abide in me, dwell in me, is the primary description of our relationship to Jesus. So in John 15, verse 4 and 5, Jesus says this. He says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vines, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. Jesus is saying, abide in me. And our abiding, our dwelling in Jesus starts today, but it continues into the new heavens and the new earth. You see that word for rooms is we have an abode. We have a dwelling, right? In the new heavens and the new earth, we will continue to abide in Him. We will continue with that intimate, deep relationship with Him. And that's what Jesus says in the next verse. Look at verse 3. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to Myself, that where I am you may be also. You see, the best part of this place that Jesus is preparing is that He will be there, right? He will be with you. 
And not even death will separate us from our union with Christ. We will enjoy that intimacy forever. And here's the amazing thing about Revelation 21, as beautiful as the description of the new heavens and new earth is, the best part is our call to worship this morning. Revelation 21, starting at verse 3, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be His people, and God Himself will be with them as their God. And listen to the intimacy of this. He will wipe every tear from our eyes, and death shall be no more, and neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And He who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. That's the place that Jesus is going to prepare for you. The place. Then secondly this morning, let's consider the way. The way. You might be thinking, wow, that, that's a beautiful place. But, but how, do I, how do we get there? And Jesus says, verse 4, and you know the way to where I am going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Now, Thomas gets a bit of a bad rap. I mean, after all, he's referred to as what, right? Doubting Thomas. But he's on to something here. You see, in order to get somewhere, in order to get somewhere, you have to know the way. One of our favorite hikes in all of the world is Sky Pond. And Sky Pond is in Rocky Mountain National Park. It's a 9.4 mile hike out and back. You transverse, uh, you go go up uh, 1,758 feet of elevation, and Sky Pond rests at 10,900 feet above sea level. You're about two miles above sea level. And this hike, you're walking through patches of snow in July, and there are steep inclines and spectacular wildlife. And then you get to the end, and you climb up this waterfall. It's about 30 yards of climbing up this waterfall where I'm going, I'm convinced every time I go up it, I'm going to die. Right? I've got this backpack on, these slippery holes. I feel like I'm going to die. And then you get up to the top, and there's this crystal clear lake and there are these large rock formations, and it's surrounded on three sides by snow-capped mountains. And then you turn around, and there's this breathtaking view of the valley below. Lee and I had hiked to Sky Pond on two separate occasions, and on our third trip, we decided it was time to take our girls with us. And uh, as we're hiking with our girls, we encountered a fellow traveler who seemed to intimate that there was more to the path than we had traveled before. And we said, huh, okay. So we transversed the waterfall at the end of the trail, and again, I thought I was going to die, and the girls just kind of scampered up it. Um, And we get to the top, and there's, you know, the beautiful view, and then you look off to the right at about 100 yards, and there's this hole in the woods. You're like, well, we have to go explore that. And sure enough, there's a path there, and you walk a little way, and then there's a sign that says Two Sky Pond. And you go a little bit further, and there's another beautiful crystal lake that opens up in a glade, right? And that's the real Sky Pond. You see, we hadn't gotten to the real Sky Pond before because we didn't know the way. And in order to get somewhere, you have to know the way. And Jesus says to you this morning, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So how is Jesus the way? How is Jesus the way? Well, that word way uh, could also be translated road or highway. And it appears 846 times in the Bible, 20 times in Luke, 16 times in Mark, 21 times in Matthew. But the word way only appears four times in the book of John. 
And three of them are here in our text. Verse 4, you know the way to where I am going. Verse 5, how can we know the way? Verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way. And it's almost as if John here is taking this common word, way, and he's setting it aside for a specific purpose. You see, the only other time in the Gospel of John that the word way is used is on the lips of John the Baptist in John 1, 23, where John the Baptist says, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight what? Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah has said. And if you go back to the context of the book of Isaiah, the way of the Lord is a way for God's people to get from exile back home. It's a way for them to get back to the promised land. Isaiah 40, verses 3 and 4, a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low, and the uneven ground shall all become level, and the rough places will become a plain. You see, God is preparing a way. He is preparing a way for His people to get home. And what does Jesus say? He says, I am the way. You see, Jesus is the way of the Lord. Jesus is the way to the Lord. And Jesus, again, as with all the I am statements, uses the definite article here. He's not a way to the Lord. He's not one among many. He's the way to the Lord. He's claiming exclusivity. And if you don't get that from the definite article, Jesus doesn't mince words here. He continues and he says, no one comes to the Father except through me. And that's echoed in 1 Timothy 2 verse 5 where Paul writes, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. And it was echoed this morning in our reading of the Westminster Standards in chapter 8, Section 2, yet one Christ, the only mediator between God and man. And in question 21 of the Shorter Catechism, who is the Redeemer of God's elect? The only Redeemer of God's elect is the Lord Jesus Christ. The only. He's claiming exclusivity. And in our pluralistic society, an exclusive claim might feel uncomfortable. Tim Keller, in one of his sermons, addresses that this way. He says, pluralism says, let's, all, let's agree that all of the religions are equally valid paths to God, right? That's what pluralism says. All religions are equally valid paths to God. No one has the right to say that they have all of the spiritual truth. We all see in part, we all see in pieces, who dares to claim that they can see the whole picture. And then uh, proponents of pluralism will often go into the blind man and the elephant illustration, right? And you've heard this before. I imagine five blind men come across an elephant, and the first blind man says, as they're describing the elephant, he says, well, the elephant is a lot like a wall. It's a lot like a wall. And the second, the second blind man says, no, 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 the elephant is a lot, a lot like the trunk of a tree. And the third blind man says, no, it's really like a fire hose. And the fourth blind man says, no, it's like a spear with a curve in it. And the fifth blind man says, no, 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 it's really like a rope, right? And you see, they all only see part. None of them sees the whole thing. And, pluralists would say, so it is with religion. No one should insist that they have the entire truth. But Keller points out that Leslie Newbegin, a British missionary to India, realized that the only way that you could know that none of the blind man could see the whole elephant was what? 
was if you could see the whole elephant. And the only way that you could know that every religion only sees a part is if you assume you have the whole truth, which is the very thing that pluralism says nobody has. So to say that no one has a superior take on spiritual reality is a superior take on spiritual reality. And to say that no one should convert everyone else to your view of spiritual reality is a view of spiritual reality that you're trying to convert everyone to. In other words, even pluralism is an exclusive claim. So it's not a matter of whether you're going to believe an exclusive claim. It's a matter of which exclusive claim you're going to believe. And as Jesus in John 14 makes this exclusive claim, this isn't some divisive, harsh statement. Jesus makes this statement. It's designed to comfort our souls in trouble. And here's the comfort. Only Jesus can get us all the way home. Only Jesus can get us all the way home. Other religions say, measure up, be good enough, achieve, accomplish. And deep down, we all know that we'll never measure up. We'll never be able to be good enough. We all fall short. You see, other religions are all bridges to nowhere. They're all incomplete paths that only get you to the first crystal lake right? Jesus says, I am the true bridge. I am the final path. I'm the, I will bridge the gap between man and God. I am the mediator, and I have done it all for you. I lived the life that you couldn't live. I died the death that you should have died. I am the way. Religion says do. Jesus says done. And oh, brothers and sisters, this is the good news of the gospel. Jesus gets us all the way home. Only Jesus gets us all the way home, which is why Jesus says in his last breath on the cross, it is finished. It is done for you. Now in verses 2 and 3, Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. And here's my question. How is Jesus going to go to prepare a place for you? I used to think of Jesus as some sort of general contractor here in this verse. There's blueprints and a hard hat and a measuring tape and some really cool heavenly saw as Jesus is building the new heavens and the new earth. But that's not what's happening here. What's the context well, we're in John 13 to 17. We're in the upper room discourse, and what comes next? In John 18, you have Jesus' betrayal and arrest. And in John 19, you have the crucifixion. You see, when Jesus says, when Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you, he's talking about tomorrow. He's talking about betrayal and injustice and humiliation. He's talking about the agony of bearing the weight of your sin and mine. He's talking about dying in our place. He's talking about the horror and the agony of the cross. That's how Jesus is going to prepare a place for you. You see, that's the way Jesus is the way to the Father. That's the way Jesus is the way of the Lord. He's going to prepare a place for you. And then we have the truth and the life. Verse 6, the truth and the life. You see, Jesus isn't just the way. He's the way and the truth and the life. But the emphasis, because of that threefold repetition in verses 4, 5, and 6, is on the way. You see, the truth and the life emphasize the way. And John's usage of language here is interesting. Can I get that chart, Andre? Um, 
way is a common word. You see it appears 846 times uh, in the Bible, more times in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but then only four times in John, right? John is reserving it for a special use. But truth and life are relatively uncommon words in the Bible, but John uses them in his gospel over and over again. 20 times he uses truth. 36 times he uses life. Jesus uses the truth and the life to explain the way. Thanks, Andre. So, here's the question. How do we understand Jesus as the truth in John? What is truth in John? Well, we learn in John chapter 1 that Jesus is full of grace and truth. And in John chapter 4, Jesus tells the Samaritan woman, we worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And in John chapter 8, Jesus tells the truth. And we find out in John 14 and 15 that the Spirit is the Spirit of truth. And in John 17, that we are sanctified by the truth. But maybe the most defining and clear use of truth that informs what Jesus is saying here is in John 8, 31 and 32, where Jesus says to the Jews who had just believed him, he says, if you abide... There's, there's that word again. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you shall know the truth, and what? And the truth will set you free. You see, Jesus is that truth. Well, how is he the life? Well, life in John is used 36 times. And the adjective eternal is used with that 16 times. He's talking about eternal life. So much so that any time Jesus or John refers to life in the Gospel of John, he's referring to eternal life. Now, those I am statements, right, that we're walking through, these are core foundational truths about the person of Christ. Do you know how many of them use life? We're going with 4.5 this morning, 4.5. Let me explain. In three, it's clear, right? I am the bread of life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. But in two, Jesus refers to life indirectly. When Jesus says, I am the light of the world, in John 8, he goes on to say, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will what? But will have the light of life. And when he refers to the good shepherd in John 10, he says, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, right? It occurs in five of the seven I am statements. And life, eternal life, is the purpose of the book. You know, sometimes you have to discover, well, what, what it, why is the author writing this? But John tells you in John 20, verse 31, he says, these signs are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. You see, Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. Well, how do the truth and the life, explain how Jesus is the way. Scholars explain that Jesus is the way because He is the truth. He is the truth because He's the mediator of the revelation of God, right? Jesus is God's authoritative representative. He hears what God says. He obeys what God tells Him to do, and He discloses God unlike anyone else because he has seen God. He is the revelation of God. That's how Jesus is the way. And Jesus is the way because he is the life. That is, the life of God resides in him. That's both creation and new creation. Jesus brings life, but he doesn't just bring life. He is the life, right? Jesus says in John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. And this is eternal life. Jesus is the way because he is the life. 
And as Jesus says, I am the way, right? He's claiming that role of mediator between man and God. And as the truth, he mediates the revelation of God. And as the life, he mediates the salvation of God, which is life in God. Jesus is the way, the only avenue to God, because he is the truth and the life. F.F. F. Bruce writes, all truth is God's truth, as all life is God's life. But God's truth and God's life are incarnate in Jesus. And because God's truth and God's life are incarnate in Jesus, he is the way. No one comes to the Father except through him. Jesus said to them, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But you see, when Jesus says that, he's saying it in the safety of the upper room. But Jesus knows what is coming. He knows what the next day holds. He knows the cost. And so Morris writes, I am the way, said the one who would shortly hang impotent on a cross. He says, I am the truth when the lives of evil people were about to enjoy a spectacular triumph. He says, I am the life when within a matter of hours his corpse would be placed in a tomb. And Jesus knows all of that, but it doesn't deter him. He looks at his disciples and through them down the corridors of time to you and to me, and he says, let not your hearts be troubled. I go to prepare a place for you, and I'm the only one who can take you all the way home. And brothers and sisters, you might think that this is something for the future, some sort of final answer for life's end, and it is, but it's so much more than that. You see, the way isn't just something that's out there somewhere, some day. It's something that begins here. It begins now. You see, as Jesus says, I am the way, he's inviting you on a journey. He's inviting you into the way. He's inviting you to take the next step. He's inviting you to abide with him, to be with him, to dwell in him. You see, Jesus isn't just the way for you in the future. He's the way now. And Jesus takes you all the way home. And that journey begins in, in our present. It's a part of our present. The path is before you. And as we abide in Jesus, we are on the way. We're on the way. And that's why in the book of Acts, Christianity is called the way, right? Because if you are in Jesus, you are on the way. You see, to be on the way is to have truth, is to know truth, and to have life. So the Wizard of Oz and Castaway and the Martian and Unbroken raise questions. Pilgrim's Progress raises questions. Will we get home? How do we get home? Can we make it home? And to those questions, Jesus answers, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And he's saying, let not your hearts be troubled. I go to prepare a place for you, and I am the only one who can take you all the way home. You see, Jesus is the only way home, and to be on the way is to know truth and to have life. You think about that in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we consider what Jesus did to prepare a place for us, 
and the security and safety that we have at that beautiful place of the new heavens and the new earth is now ours as we are on the way. I pray that you would, in this moment, make more real the deep, deep love of Jesus, the love of every love the best. Would you do that in our hearts now, I ask, in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, and let's stand together and sing our hymn of response, The Deep, Deep Love of Jesus. And it lifts me up to glory, for it lifts me up to thee. Giving is an element of worship. Thank you for those of you who give online. If you'd like to give in person, there, there's a box here in the narthex, and you can give on your way out. This morning, Jean and Betty Marsha Dent are our prayer intercessors. They'll be up front if you want someone to pray with or for you. And receive now God's good name as he puts it on you through the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Until the day breaks and the shadows flee away. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You are dismissed.